I know you're all really here for the next part of this chapter, but we still had to get through this first. So there are quite a few enemies here, including a couple of pretty strong Feral One Tigers. They actually roll lower speed than they usually do on this attempt though. But 24 strength is nothing to sneeze at. And we also have yet another Siege Tome here, Bolting. This Sage's stats are pathetic, seriously. This is the kind of stats I'd expect from enemies in Chapter 18. And a couple of snipers over here. The longbow guy can, actually he can't shoot through the walls, which is kind of nice. The doors here are being guarded by generals, one of uh, whom will drop his silver lance. And we have a swordmaster here. This swordmaster has a brave sword. This is the no damage miss, no damage miss guy that I was referring to in the last chapter, because he tends to not really be much of a threat. We also have a couple of unpromoted armor knights here. It's really weird. I don't know why they exist. They're some of the few unpromoted enemies you ever see at this point in the game. We also have some thieves. Now, I actually like to let one of these thieves open this door because that saves me the effort. There are going to be quite a lot of chests here and um, a few doors to open, so I may need to bring both Soth and Volk here. Oh, I guess I should show you the other side of the map. There's a bunch of warriors over here, another feral tiger, another swordmaster, and this thief. This thief is very interesting because if we kill him before he steals any treasure, he drops the double bow. And it's a very strange weapon. Firstly, it only has 7 might, which is awful for an S-rank weapon. But secondly, look at that range. That's 4 range, but it's 4 range exactly. Not 2 to 4, not even 3 to 4, exactly 4. It's a very awkward weapon, and it tends to be useful very rarely. But I'm gonna get it, because it's at least an S rank weapon. So, this is the first chapter where deploying Alincia is optional, so if you're worried here, you might want to not deploy her. Now let's see, I definitely want all of these people, but maybe not Ranulf? Although Ranulf does have Smite. But I will need at least one Thief, and I might actually want both my Thieves. In which case I may have to drop Alincia, which is a shame, because Alincia actually has some good items. I'd really like to use her here. But I think I need everyone else. Hmm. There are going to be... chest keys that are droppable, and also... You might as well carry a few chest keys. I've got a few spares, don't I? Yeah, I do have some spares. I doubt you'll be needing that vulnerable anymore, so go ahead and take another spare chest key. There you go. Okay, and because of that, Jill's gonna go this side, you're gonna go that way too. Stefan will obviously be trying to take on this warrior. I'd like to have Titania go down that side too. I can Sorin will head straight up. Does Sorin have any fire tomes? Maybe you should take fire due to all the beast lagoos here. So, Sorin... Might not need Blizzard for now. I guess we have a few more uses left on that. And Gaetri will go forward, because I kind of want him to. Other than that, I think these, although Volk will go on whatever side the chest keys aren't going on. Does someone in here drop chest keys? Yes, you do. So I don't really need a thief in here, because that's enough chest key uses to open both chests. So with that, I'm actually going to save my preparations here, because I might have to redo this part, and I don't want to have to do preparations over again. Okay, here we go. It is time for the showdown before the showdown. And we have this music again. And I should mention, this is the map that on my dad's really dark TV, everything just looked purple. Still looks pretty dark here, but I'm not really sure why everything came out purple on that TV. That was a fairly old, not, not really old, it was okay by the standards of its time, but... Yeah, I should mention that back in the day, most of my, um... You seem to have rolled enough speed to not get doubled by Ike, dang it. Back in the day, I actually used a CRT TV for a lot of stuff. I didn't actually get a, like, I currently have a flat screen TV uh, that's an LCD that has, um... Is this gonna kill you? It might actually kill you. That has HDMI ports and stuff, but... I used to do most of my console uh, gaming on a really good CRT TV, it was a pretty good German model, and it was great, and I, I have heard that older games tend to work best, as in with least lag, on a CRT TV, to the point where many Smash Brothers tournaments actually are played on CRT TVs, because the lag is a really big deal. 
Yeah, apparently some LCD TVs or flat screens have something called... That was a pretty unlucky miss, actually, but you're probably going to be attacking uh, her again on the enemy phase anyway. Some TVs have a thing called game mode, which kind of reduces latency, but, um, yeah, I've heard that it can be particularly bad for rhythm games. Because, like, again, unless you're playing a competitive fighting game or a rhythm game, the lag usually isn't that noticeable, but in a rhythm game it really, really is. But anyway, obscure TV trivia. The current TV I'm using, I'm sorry to get into depressing territory, but I actually got it from my um, grandmother when she passed away. It's actually a pretty small one, but it's good for my purposes. And I'm glad that I actually do have a flat screen now, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to use the capture device I'm currently using, because it's HDMI only. And that was obviously a sole crit, thus once again proving that certain mastery skills, which is most of them, can critical. Okay, I think for the moment we're alright. And I might as well... You the Flamlands is not KOing you. Actually, wait. Firstly... I brought the Hammer and Star for a reason. Could probably repair Wyburn as well if I wanted to. And nice developer laziness, they just palette swap the animation for uh, the, the uh, Restore Staff, I believe. I rarely see the Hammer and Staff even get used in this game, though. It's kind of a, um... I don't know, like I said, because you don't get many S-rank weapons, there aren't a lot of things that are worth repairing other than Forges. And maybe Long Range Tomes. Or some other staffs, like the uh, Ashera Staff. You're probably going to go for Jill now because of the uh, lack of counter-attacking. And like I said, Vault goes in whichever direction does not have chest keys, which is this direction. Elincia will, at the moment, just um, hang around here. Though it's a bit overkill seeing two healers down one way, so what do you have? You have Rescue, Recover, and Sleep. Yes, you can head this way. And I'm, yeah, you're only in range of Bolting, right? Pretty sure you're only in range of Bolting. I think I'll need Racing on the central front. Because once we open that door in the very center of the map, whoever goes through there is going to get mauled by tons and tons of enemies, so I might need Racing to help break through them. I mean this door, by the way. Um. Oh, that's interesting. I can actually repair the staff you have in your inventory. Anyway, this guy is rarely that big of a threat, but... He can be annoying sometimes. In my test run of this game, and also this warrior did exactly what I thought he'd do, in my test run of this game, I um, had Provoke on Gaytree, but he didn't even need Provoke there. I decided against it in this playthrough because Gaytree doesn't really one round a lot of things, so I was kind of hurting my, uh, my damage output by giving him Provoke, and also it drew in Siege turns, which obviously Gaytree doesn't really like taking all that well. I still love how generals just go down on their knee when they um when they die in this game. And unfortunately we broke our spear. And I probably should have put the Silver Lance in my second slot, because not one rounding an unpromoted Armor Knight is just sad. Really sad. But oh well. Let's hope we can finish these guys off. Oh yeah, there's a few poison weapons here as well, but poison weapons rarely do much in, in this game. Well, they... I was about to say, in what game do they do much? And then I realized Thrakia. Poison weapons are actually kind of dangerous in Thrakia. Especially due to that really annoying thing where it's like, oh yeah, yeah, the basic dark magic poisons enemies, but when you use it, it doesn't poison! Ugh. Last episode I said I don't think Thrakia 776 is as hard as many people claim it is, but I do think it has plenty of just downright annoying game like game mechanics that make it difficult for all the wrong reasons sometimes. Like healing styles being able to miss! That's a great mechanic, right? One thing that is actually kind of interesting though, some people have been saying, oh yeah, if FE4 gets remade, I'd like to have true hit in it. The funny thing is, 
FE4 is one of the few games that doesn't have true hit where I don't mind the lack of true hit because your evade rates with certain legendary weapons are just so overkill in that game that true hit would just make the game even more ridiculously broken, so I feel like it doesn't even need true hit. Yeah, these guys do move. They're not just being pure door guards. I don't think I will finish you off. Or he will because of a crit. I was expecting ether, but a crit works too. Yep, Ike needs to get some practice fighting generals because he'll be fighting a very important general soon. And that. Guess I can give that to Gaitry if I want. And this means Ike's gonna get a door key if he ethers or crits here. And he got neither. Oh well. At least he doubles. Because I would be very concerned if he wasn't doubling generals. At this point in the game, Ike usually has camp speed for me naturally. I don't know what happened this playthrough, but I guess it's karmic vengeance for... Not so much vengeance, but karmic payback for my last playthrough where Ike somehow managed to camp resistance without the aid of stat boosters. I don't know how he managed to do that, but he did. You can't even get to the door, so I'm not worried about you. Don't even need the silver sword there, but um, let's just do that anyway, because Stefan only has silver swords or blades. I find that enemies with killer weapons have this odd tendency to get critical in most of my runs. Death by irony. Speaking of irony, why are you not gaining strength? I have the fighter band on you. Thief band. Oh, right, I have the thief band on you. I get the fighter band to mist. That's why you're not gaining strength. Okay, so that's actually somewhat understandable. Tigers are going to be way more of a threat in Red in Dawn, as I may have said many times, but not so much here. And I was about to have a link to heal you, but... Well, I guess you still have a little bit of health to go. Soul is really fun, though. It's a pretty good skill. Uh, I can't cancel you very far if I want Alincia to heal you, though. Which is kind of a shame. I wonder if Alincia can kill that thief. 19 attack power and you have 6 defense. Alincia definitely doesn't want to run into one of those sword users, though. Sword users. Well, yeah, any sword user, but mainly the sword masters. Um, yes, let's waste the use of the recover staff on 1 HP. At least we can see its animation. Not quite as cool as it looks in the GBA games, though. Though I still love how Fortify looks there. Just making all those little heal animations and then a giant explosion of healing. That just always looked really cool to me. Hmm, let's just go... Let's go for this, because it's actually one-shotting. Oh, yeah, that was it. I just remember that the, um, the, the late-game Forge weapon that I made for Nephany uh, in that one other playthrough where I was making references was, uh, was Bionic Farm! Which, um comes from a game that got cancelled for various reasons. Uh, don't want you wasting that, but it is the only way I'll one-shot you. And depending on how things go, that one Armor Knight may get to live. He's just not worth experience to pursue. Like, or he might end up suiciding himself into Nephany anyway. In fact, that's probably what he's going to do because enemies are dumb and have no sense of self-preservation. Well, actually enemies in this game kind of have a sense of self-preservation, but only if there's a healing nearby or if they have a healing item in their inventory. Right then, let's see. Yeah, you guys still have decent hit rates even um, even when Soren's in Ike's support range. Because, like I said, Lagoos have really high hit rates, and that's going to really come into play in Radiant Dawn. Their hit rates can actually get even higher in that game, because Lagoo's weapons actually upgrade in that one, though you're unlikely to see it happen very much. Yeah, that was one of those good concepts in Radiant Dawn that I wish more was done with. But I still I still think Radiant Dawn is really, really good. It's still one of my not just one of my favorite games in the series, one of my favorite games of all time. I get so much joy out of replaying that game. Not that I don't get joy out of replaying this game, this game's great too but I just, it doesn't quite rank up there with, um, can I do something silly? Oh, not quite. Curses. 
Uh, who picked up the door key? Oh, you have the door key. Right, I need to make sure to lure you with someone like Yatri. Or Little Lord Ikey. Yes, he still has that nickname. So people will say, does that make him Big Lord Ikey in Radiant Dawn? And then I'm like, actually, no, he's not a lord anymore in that game. <laughs> Sorry, that's probably spoilers, but you probably could have seen that coming. Ike really does not like being a noble. Another one of the reasons why an Ike and a Lindsay pairing would not work, like I've said before. As much as, um, <laughs> weirdly enough, my mum ships Ike and Alincia. <laughs> There's a funny story I can talk about regarding- Oh, I can also just break the door. Sometimes I forget that you can break doors in this game. But, don't really need to do that here. I was about to say I kind of wish you could break chests, but wouldn't that destroy the item inside? Probably would. And I doubt I'm going to be using the hammer and staff anymore, so I might as well trade for the restore staff racing broad. No, let's not do that for now. I still don't care. If that hit, I would say, okay, I care a little bit now, but it didn't, so... And, like I predicted, you're suiciding yourself with Tenefini because you're an idiot. And you didn't even get to attack. Enemy is not being aware of vantage. That just suddenly reminded me of how... I like in Heroes how the, the combat forecast does take into account skills. Because sometimes I look at an enemy and I'm in the combat forecast and I'm like, wait a minute, it says I'm going to end with zero HP and they're not going to take damage? And I'm like, oh right, quick repost slash vantage slash whatever is going on there. Or them having a special or something like that. Yeah, the developers, like, uh, some people speculate the reason why there's no combat forecast in this game is because the developers thought that, um, it might interfere with, um, not interfere, like, skills might interfere with it too much, and it would be just, they didn't really have the, um, they couldn't really program the combat forecast to keep up with things like resolve triggering mid-battle or something like that. But, I guess they finally can in Heroes. Just gonna equip that even though that probably won't kill you. I wanna leave you alive so you can open that door, because we don't have door keys on that side. But yeah, you have a door key now, so let's go ahead and unlock that door. Although now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure I usually have Gatry just break that door. And little Lord Ike should be okay there. And yeah, if Soren goes here, he will be blocked. I just don't want Soren getting hit by tigers. Still not exactly the biggest fan of this song. Wow, Titania is one of the few people here who's actually getting weighed down by things. And I just wasted my opportunity to give Alincia some healing experience because Sol. I guess thieves do give um, a bit of an experience bonus in this game. Also, here's the double bow. I'm obviously not going to use that. Even if I was training Roll for Shinnan, I still usually don't end up using it because so it can be situationally helpful in a few of the trial maps, but it's really, really awkward to use. Really awkward. It's probably one of the most bizarre weapons in the series, although there are a few weird ones in Fates in terms of how they work, but the double bow in this one is just pretty odd. Seriously, full range exactly is much harder to get in range of than you would probably think. Well, I can finally shut up your bolting. At least you're not as annoying as GBA bolting guys who will, who take advantage of the fact that Thieves and Roy can't promote for ages. Well, Thieves can't promote at all. And just go, oh hey, bolting magnet time. Thought you would do that. You may not die, but that depends on Adept. Also, Brave Sword. <laughs> double miss. You're not getting doubled though, unfortunately. I don't even have- why the heck are you going for Gatry and not Ike? Do you know that Ike will double you or something? Well, you did three damage to him at least. 
Yeah, the AI usually prioritizes the most damage, but at the top of their priority list is almost always... Uh, well, firstly in the priority list is if I can kill something, then I'll go for it, but the next thing is always avoid counterattacks, usually. Which is why the unarmed Titan uh, Titania strategy works wonders earlier in this game. Oh, right, Longbow. That's fine. I don't really care. Again, I don't really care. Soren is not quite said levels of ridiculously evasive Wind Mage, but he's pretty good at evading things. He gets a bit worse at it in Radiant Dawn, though, thanks to how badly mages get screwed over in that game. Radiant Dawn is not a kind game to mages. Soren is the best one in that game by default, but he's still not amazing. Anyway, though, that's for later. Oh yeah, and the moment that any one of these doors is opened, this whole room is revealed, which means that these bishops are going to start being able to sleep and silence us. So, that's fun. Yeah. Do I have the chest keys? You have the chest keys. Okay, so whoever takes those should be someone I don't plan on using for a lot of combat. I will say it again. Erwindo. Just because that's Robin's recovering move in Smash, and because I... I've said this before, but I watch a lot of Shadow of Chaos and Smash videos, and he plays with Japanese voices on. Speaking of which, a lot of people wondered why in that uh, test video that I uploaded of Nino Kuni 2, a lot of people were wondering why I... Um... Yeah, that'll be enough. Were wondering why I had the Japanese voices in Nino Kuni. That's because I usually play games with English voices. Um, because... There's actually several reasons for that. So, anime. I always watch anime Japanese with subtitles. Uh, except, the one exception is Persona 4 The Animation, because one, the voice actors from the game are amazing, and two, that game's... And two, that anime's dub is fantastic, it's one of the best dub I've ever heard, and a lot of the dub is legitimately funnier than the Japanese version. Plus, uh, Johnny Young Barsh's Yu Narukami is amazing in the anime, which is what I told him when I met him at a convention. But, anyway, you know what, now is a good time for the rescue staff. Because I'll be able to open that door right now. And I love the animation, how it's the same animation that Black Knight makes when he warps. That animation is also used for Ike's entrance in, um, I think one of those stages has a siege tome. Yes, he does, so I need to be careful with Alinsia there. But yeah, that's the, um, animation that Ike makes when he enters the field in, um, Smash Brothers which is pretty cool. Now, I do have to be a bit careful because, yeah, there are some long-range people there, so Titania will need to move in such a way that she, um... <laughs> Vol could try and break down the door with his knife, which is a funny image, but I doubt that'll really do much in the way of anything effective. Ah, oh, wow, effectiveness weapons in this game suck. And hand axes kind of suck when your strength is this low. I'm going to equip the hand axe anyway, just because that sage might attack her. But anyway, as I was saying about, about dubs and stuff. So yeah, the reason why I always watch anime subtitled in Japanese is because dubs suffer lip lock syndrome. They have to make sure to match the, the mouth flaps, and that often results in lines not being translated properly because the actual correct translation would not match the lip flaps, and it also results in some very awkward lines sometimes. Like, um... Yeah. I always, like, I, I recently got confirmation that this was true, but I always suspected that the reason why Ash is called Ash Ketchum, despite not having a surname in the Japanese version, is because his Japanese name is three syllables, uh, Satoshi, and uh, his English first name is only one, so they had to fit in extra syllables. It's also, and this is also something that I suspected for a very long time, why um, characters will often say, Pokemon, insert attack name here, now. Like, they'll often say now at the end of an attack name, and that's also because of mouth movements. Something kind of cool about the Pokemon anime, I'm going a bit of a tangent here, but um, Pikachu actually... Um, 
Something that I didn't notice when I first watched it growing up is that is that the way that Pikachu like Pikachu actually does learn the other characters' names. So, for example, like Misty's Japanese name is Kasumi, so I think Pikachu calls her Pikachu Pikachu P, which sounds like Kasumi chan. And then Brock is Takeshi, and so that's Pikachu with a long exaggerated sound at the end. Here I am giving trivia about a not only my most hated Pokemon of all time, but one of my most hated anime characters of all time. I really don't like Pikachu in the anime. But I still think it's interesting how they how Pikachu kind of has has its own language. I like I think Pikachu even has an oh no, it's Team Rocket, um like a way of saying that. So it's just it's kind of I say kind of interesting that they do that. Also, this is going to be fun. I'm going to put Jill in that gap with the Lugu's axe and all of those Lugu's are going to get massively destroyed. Which is kind of ironic considering post-character development, Jill. But, anyway. Going back to the real... So yeah, that's why I always watch anime with subtitles rather than the dub is because... Those lip-sync issues. But games usually don't have that problem. Well, they used to, like as Final Fantasy X can attest to sometimes, which is why Auron is the only character. <sighs> I'm glad that wasn't a one shot, but that scared me for a second. Which is why Auron is the one character who speaks normally in Final Fantasy X because he has a collar that conveniently covers his mouth. That was always pretty funny. Okay, that's Thor. I forgot that was Thor on. And that hit because. Oh no, it didn't. Okay. Oh, not quite a one round, but that Sage still took quite a lot of damage. I do think generic enemy Sages look pretty cool in this game. But Sages and Radiant Dawn look pretty awesome as well. And their crit animations in Radiant Dawn are really, really good. As you'll probably be seeing eventually. Yay, I healed 1 HP. Even though I didn't even need any healing. So most games these days, either, like, the majority of games don't even bother to lip-sync anyway, so the dub can often get away with a direct translation. And before you ask, I don't mind the lip issues in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Again, like, I feel like most games don't even lip-sync even to the Japanese dub, so it's pretty much fine. Uh, but also because, I don't know, I just find that game dubs seem to have a lot better quality than most anime dubs. And so that's, but the reason why I play Nino Kuni 2 with the Japanese voices is because it's, you know, a game by Studio Ghibli, which make anime films, and thus I basically consider it an anime, and thus I, it feels weird not to have it in the Japanese voices. Even though, um... Like, even Ni no Kuni 1 was very obviously what we call dub-titled. I mean, all games are. I don't think there's any game that isn't dub-titled. Dub-titling is when um, uh, something can be played in the original source language with subtitles, but the subtitles are just a transcript of the English dub. Which happens with some anime, but it's often very noticeable for games because, for example, I believe in the beginning of the first Nino Kuni, there's a character who gets referred to as one name and the Japanese voice acting is clearly saying something else, which is also the case in um, Nino Kuni 2. But um, Evan and Roland have the same name in Japanese, but um, Leander is. I never know what his name is supposed to be. It's, it's like Seshi Ryusu? Seshirius? That sounds like a weird... I don't even know what that name's supposed to be, like I said. And then, um, Bracken Meadows is, um... I, I actually like her Japanese name better. It's Sheria Bracken. I think Bracken makes more sense as a surname than as a first name, so I actually like her Japanese name better. But, like, for the majority of, like... And some of them... Some of them are like they just translated the name to an equivalent English, like, pun name, like... Like, Mousinger is like. It was like Chudain or something like that in Japanese. Chu being Mouse Squeak. So, like, it's a mouse joke in both languages, so that's pretty much a direct equivalent. One case where the dub titling got kind of obvious, though, is that, um. Not to spoil anything, but the the final strike against the final boss, in the Japanese version, that's just a very, very generic Kono Ichigeki Dare, or 
I will decide it with this one attack, which is a really stock anime phrase. In English, it's a much more personal speech about, like, for the world, for everyone, blah, blah, blah. Like, so I like that one a lot better than the Japanese line. But anyway, that was a big tangent. So now I'm going to... Maybe these guys don't start using sleep until we open this door. Let's see. That made me think of... Stop! Don't open that door! That was before Albert Wesker was voiced by the amazing DC Douglas. Speaking of tangents, I, I had this funny story because, um... Once I was watching TV and an old repeat episode of NCIS came on and a DC Douglas plays a random side character in one of those episodes. Because like, I, I was listening to it and I was like, huh, I recognize your voice. Is that seriously DC Douglas in a live action show? And then I googled it and sure enough, it was DC Douglas. So it's always kind of funny when you see voice actors you Because some voice actors do do live action shows just... Some of them don't really do it all that much anymore. But that was just kind of funny, because his voice was instantly recognisable. Just like, oh wow, that's DC Douglas, isn't it? And that animation is still cool. But yeah, while on the subject of tangents, I guess I could go on one that originally I would have said this in the previous part, but I felt like it went on for far too long and um, it wasn't really all that necessary for me to say, so... Okay, you're both level 18, so there's no real reason to prioritize one of you over the other here. I like how the Flame Lance is very often in this chapter doing exactly enough damage to kill something. I would have been fine with attacking at one range because of... Um, I almost said cancel there, guard. And there's another skill called Guard in Radiant Dawn, so it's really confusing. But that's a skill that I tend never really works well. But anyway, the tangent that I was going to go on was... Well, I guess I can actually start doing this. I only have two uses left to the job. It's a pain. But it's about the, myth the mythological references of Ragnar and Elondite, so is, I'm pretty sure, named after Lancelot's sword, and the main reason I know that is because of Sonic and the Black Knight. Or sometimes it's called Arondite, so it, it, it's kind of the name. I, I think Elondite sounds cooler, but I feel like Arondite is the real way it's supposed to be. I suppose I could take that. Oh yeah, and I can't trade it for the Silver Lance because of um, it being in an item, not a weapon. But that was going to lead me into a tangent on like the mythological references in various Fire Emblem games, because obviously Fire Emblem draws on a lot of mythology, but what I like is that pretty much every Fire Emblem universe has its own sort of mythology that it draws from. So, for example, Marth's games are very much influenced by Greek and Roman mythology, because Marth comes from Mars, the Roman god of war. You have a character named Pala, which comes from Pallas Athena. You have a city called Thebes, which comes from Thebes. In fact, it's literally called Thebes in the Japanese version. And there was actually going to be a place called Thebes, I think, in the early beta of this game as well. Yeah, I don't want to rush through there just yet. Titania should be fine there. You don't have a crit rate on Volk, do you? 12, and Volk has... You do. Well, that's a problem. That's a serious problem. Here is another use of shove, pushing someone out of enemy range. That requires Zephyr to get back quite far. And that's why I traded the Restore Staff back to Mist. Okay, good, that Mist. No pun intended there. Whenever I accidentally say a pun, it's not intended because I don't like puns. 
But anyway, we're all saying about mythological references. So yeah, Mars games are very Greek and Roman influenced. Genealogy is obviously heavily Norse based, but Leif and Leonster, most of the characters from there have a Celtic influence in their names. And Deirdre is also Celtic, so it's kind of a bit of both Celtic and Norse, but mostly Norse. And Elib is very Arthurian. Like you have people called Roland, Durandal I think is Arthurian. Armads, I think, is also Arthurian. Um, I know that Dubin is um, Arthurian as well. Like, a lot of um, Elid is very Arthurian. Then you have Magvel, the Sacred Stones, which has a lot of Hebrew names. Like Joshua, and I think Naomi comes from it? Um, oh, Joshua's obvious, and then... Things like Jahana as well, so there's, there's a lot of that kind of influence. And then you come to Tellius, and Tellius is kind of a mishmash of everything. So, like, you know, you have um, Alondite, which comes from the name of Lancelot's sword. Ragnall and Gawain are also Arthurian. Ragnall is the name of Gawain's wife, I believe. And... I forget exactly where Etard comes from, but I think that's also Arthurian. And Ashnard's sword, which we'll be seeing a lot later, also comes from Arthurian mythology. But you also have a lot of... Like, Leth comes from um, a river in the underworld that I'm pretty sure is Greek. Mordecai, I think Mordecai is Hebrew, but I'm not completely sure on that. I forget where Ranulf comes from, but I'm sure Ranulf is probably some kind of a reference. Um, something tells me Ranulf is Celtic, but I'm probably horribly wrong about that. There's a lot of different influences in the Tellius games, basically. And then Awakening sort of drew from everything, because that was kind of a celebration of the whole series. And then Fates, obviously, you have uh, Japanese for Hoshido, and Nor was kind of uh, a combination of Celtic and medieval European, and a tiny bit of Norse, because you had Ragnarok and Elnia or some of the tome names, and actually Fimbleverter as well, I not that one? And then Heroes, which is even more Norse than Genealogy, which I didn't even think was possible, but they somehow managed it. And then the Three Houses seems like it's going to be primarily Celtic, Scottish, I think, and a bit of, like, Old English as well, so that's going to be interesting. So I like how they choose a specific sort of mythology for each Fire Emblem region just to kind of give it its own flavour. Again, except for, like, this game was sort of a mix of everything. And you might think that reinforcements will come out of these stairs, but they don't. So at the moment, we're doing kind of well, although... I might need to rescue staff seven now, honestly. And that's two uses of the rescue staff gone already. Might need to hammer and staff that, actually. Probably a very good candidate for the hammer and staff now I think about it. Also gives a ton of experience. Well, you gain magic. If you didn't gain magic, that would be pretty bad because, yeah, you have an 80% growth in that stat. Let's see if I can finish off some of these guys. I might want to finish off the spear guys or... I would get rid of the bolting guy, but that would result in Stefan needing to plug this uh, area here, and that would mean that he might be in trouble because he might not be able to... Actually, though, you have pretty good dodge rates against these guys, so... Of course, that's not doing it, though. You know what? I guess let's go for this thing. We're at the very end of the game. We might as well use it. I think it's Varg Kati, it's pronounced. I used to call it the Vague Katai, but that's definitely not it, because I know that um, Lin's Manaik uh, Kati is, is Kati, not Katai. Which I'm pretty sure means, like, Moon... Katana or something. Just randomly speaking of things, I don't really like the redesign of Soul Katai, Soul Kati in some of the other games. I still can't believe that Lin's unique animation with Soul Kati was added in the English version, like that it didn't exist in the Japanese version. That always felt kind of strange to me, and I think I really need to physic Titania from over here, because otherwise she... I'm more worried about Stefan, honestly, because if he gets hit by Bolting and the Tiger, that might be bad.
And yeah, I still like how powerful mages can be in this game despite their low might on their weapons. Yeah, that's gonna be something that's not that great in Radiant Dawn. Speaking of Radiant Dawn, the double bow is so much better in that game. Double bow is ridiculous in that game, but I, I won't spoil exactly what it is for people who don't know what it does in that one. But, um, I appreciate magic and speed. But yeah, I'm not gonna spoil it, but it's, it's, it's pretty interesting what it does in that one, and uh, it's one of the reasons why on foot. I mean, I'm pretty sure Mounted Archers can use a double bow in that game, but Radiant Dawn is one of the few games in the series where on foot archers are better than mounted versions. For various reasons, which I will get into, and you will certainly see once we get to that game. Uh, can I get through? Yes, I can get through, except he was gonna open the chest. No, oh, that's annoying. I guess he has to conserve his energy for the Black Knight fight. But Ike does get a full heal before that battle. It effectively counts as a separate chapter. Also, look, yay, a Physic Staff. It's not like we couldn't just, I don't know, steal two of them from those bishops. So, that was a helpful thing to get, not... I won't say no to an extra Physic Staff, but with how easy it is to steal them in this game... I'll need to get used to that while it still lasts, because, again might not be the same in Radiant Dawn, for various reasons. Also, lol, Heavy Spear only doing one damage. But yeah, Starves actually get equipped in Radiant Dawn, so they can't be easily stolen. There is actually a certain trick you can use in the final chapter of this game that makes a certain enemy... Let me just check something. How are you in... I forgot that was a brave bow. Okay, change of strategy. Also, that could be really bad too, considering Solon's luck with getting critted this playthrough. But a brave bow with a 60 hit rate is not something that I want to try and deal with. I should probably just play this safe and keep Soren back. Because I can't, you know, keep you over this wall. Let's go open this chest and then. Spear! Good, I've needed one more of those. Move you there. Have Nephany. Except she already has chest keys from that enemy she just beat. Fortify! Finally! This is a very useful staff to take into later chapters, obviously. It's a pretty good one. But something in one of these chests is something that you also want to make sure you pick up for the final chapters. It really comes in handy there. You're gonna try to do this one more time. I really hope that you miss. Good. Huh. Never seen you go down there before. But I don't like that at all, because that tiger's going to attack Stefan too. We all saw that coming. And now I can finish off the other enemy and then um, have Sauron run in and melee the um, brave bow guy to death. I don't think we've ever seen Nephany's non-kill critical animation, so that's the closest thing we'll get. No! You went for Titania. Okay then. I won't question that, but I'm not sure what you were thinking. Because if, if, if all three went for Stefan, he may have died here. I say may have, because he probably would have dodged the short spear anyway, but still. Oh, uh, also there's Renewal. I, I like the blue healing aura that Renewal makes, but trust me, we'll be seeing Renewal in action soon. Can I? Yes, I can throw my hand axe down, except that's not actually going to kill you. 15. Wait a minute. Six. Again, why didn't you go for Stefan? That doesn't make any sense. I wonder if I can hammer... 
No. I don't like that 1% chance, so I'm going to heal Stefan anyway. Feels like this song's actually on a shorter loop than the previous map theme. Now I'm wishing Stefan had a sign sword. But with his tiger down, hopefully. Oh, there's Astra. Now I used exactly one use of the Vargati against that other enemy, and I got Astra there. So let's see how many uses I consumed. Yeah, that looks like it took three uses. Oh yeah, this also gives plus three defense, so that might have been why you decided to not attack Stefan. I know there are some games where enemies don't notice modifiers to your stats, but this is probably not one of them. Now I'm wishing I had racing over here, especially due to Volk, but oh well. Okay, now you can get to Volk. Hmm. In what manner of dying are you at? Not really, okay. And nothing's going to be able to get to it this year now. Let's put some truth to the phrase, Alincia fights and Crimea wins the day. She also has this unique pink mane Pegasus. And there's always just been debate over whether or not the, um, because her, like, her Pegasus looks way more, um, um, way more Alicorn-like than any of the, and that's not officially what those things are called in mythology. Like, that was actually wrong, and, um, it was a fandom term that was wrong that got adopted as canon because, yeah. But there's always been debate over whether Falcon Knights actually are winged unicorns or whether the horn's just part of the armor. It really could be either, but Elincia's looks a lot more like that than any other one. I explained in um, Persona 3 that Alicorn is actually the substance that unicorn horns are said to be made out of. Which in Persona 3 is an item that you get as a heart item from the unicorn, the Persona, and it nullifies poison, which is another mythological reference because that's what unicorn horns were supposed to be able to do in mythology. So that was a pretty cool reference. Though, you know, Persona has a lot of, like, it gets its mythological references pretty much spot on all the time. I'm gonna have to do this. I might want to keep some of the bishops alive just to steal their starves. Which is starting to remind me of Frack here. You could steal a lot of very good starves in that game. Especially rewarp starves. Stealing those was always fun. Oh yeah, I need to remind myself I'm gonna have to fight the boss with Soren. Not have to, but I kind of want to because, well, I'll cover the boss in a bit. Not quite yet, but I will cover the boss in a moment. Because we are approaching them. And this chapter was a bit quicker than I thought it would be, but that's a compensation for the fact that it is a two-part chapter and you might have to be doing it over and over again. I will have to do this chapter at least twice anyway because... Because... I have to show the fail Black Knight battle, as well as the... You don't have to, yeah, yeah, you don't have like a Silver Lance or something like that. As well as the successful Black Knight battle. Because they do have very different cutscenes, and I want to show everything here. So next part might even be longer than this, because I'll have to fit in uh, both versions of the Black Knight fight, plus the Adept Wrath method that I took footage of from an earlier playthrough. Okay, so there's three chests down there, which I need to still get, and here is the boss. Speedrunners hate this guy because he has Miracle. So he has a 19% chance of reducing a lethal blow to, well, a not lethal blow. He also has a Brave Lance and surprisingly decent stats. Also a Night Ward, which you can't steal, unfortunately, because it's equipped, and there's no way he's unequipping that, so... Sadly, you can't get a second, but this late into the game, the 30% extra speed growth is not really going to be helping much. And he has the final occult scroll in the game. 
So I'm gonna just park Gatry in front of him, mainly because I would like him to... And this is arrive, not see, so it doesn't matter if I get to put to sleep. But I would like him to fight Gatry here, but I want Soren to be the one to finish him off. He does have special dialogue with Ike though, as you would expect. This guy's kind of like the Black Knight in some ways. That makes sense, because he pretty much follows the day in philosophy. <laughs> you call that a brave lance? That ain't a brave lance. This is a brave lance. I quoted that totally wrong, but, um, <laughs> which makes me a disgrace to my co Actually, you know what? I have never seen that film. I've never seen that film, and I probably don't intend to. And I've probably said this before, but fun fact, we do not say shrimp on the barbie, we call them prawns. And that's the amazingness that is, um, that is renewal working. It's really not a great skill. Hmm. Nah, even if I shove you, I'm gonna get in range, but you do have a chess key. Almost sounds like chess key for a second there. That still won't do it. So I may have to... Except, I think I might be able to get a, um... To get a, a, a trade chain going. Because if I trade the... The chest key to Alincia and then have her Kanto near the chest and then have Tanya take it and open the chest, that'll work. I'm pretty sure that would have only wasted one use of the um Vagati. Which might be a good thing to repair with um the hammer and stuff too. Yeah, it's losing a little bit of pieces. So yeah, Alincia has to grab that. And press B to get my Kanto menu up and then go over here. And then you will go over here, and then you will trade that. And then I get this chest, and it contains... Bondor! Not the one that I was looking for. There is something very good in these chests, but... Yeah, in fact, Jill might be able to reach them before Volk does. Oh, crap. Actually, no. Thank you, I can uh, chant for Jill. Because you would have attacked and got countered thanks to the Brave Land. Not Brave. And you would have got countered thanks to the Flame Lance, and it probably wouldn't have done one damage. Yeah. But still. Okay, let's open this one. The Goo's X. Still not the one that I'm looking for. How fitting that it's the last one I need. Yeah, let's do this. So, Miracle won't work because I gave Sora Nile before the chapter. One of the few cases where the Nile skill is useful. For a late game boss, that was a very generic death quote. I'm disappointed in you. You should enter most generic death quote competition. Up there with such death quotes as, Your Majesty, please forgive me. And, uh, like, I don't know, I failed everyone, if you're talking main lord death quotes, forgive me my friends, that's a very, very generic one. Also, Ike is taking a quick nap before his fight with the Black Knight. <laughs> I should probably wake him up, even though it is technically a waste of the restore stuff. There it is! The Resolve Scroll. And it doesn't really look like the Resolve Scroll. Actually, no, it kind of does. So, you want that. You really, really want that. Because that helps out so much against the final boss. So, Resolve Scroll is a really great thing to have. And now I can do this. So, that's two Physics Staffs I got out of this chapter. And is anyone close to leveling up? Soren is. Though I don't think he'll be able to finish off this guy. Well, he will with Heart of Fire. I want to forge Soren a new tome soon. Also, I just remembered I forgot to forge weapon this chapter, which is annoying. But I'll do that next chapter. 
I'll probably end up forging a Thunder Tome, not a Wind Tome, because now that Soren has enough strength to use Thunder without penalty, there's really no point in forging a Wind Tome for him. Also, for, for some reason, Forge Wind Tomes are stupidly expensive. Not as stupidly expensive as Forge Light Tomes, though. D. Wait a minute. Restore is C, right? Yeah, so Soren can't cure Ike of Sleep and get himself... Uh, he'll probably get a level up out of that if he could do that, but... Anyone here need... Well, Gatry needs healing, I guess. I doubt Soren will level up out of using a basic heal staff to heal, though, because... Yeah, experience of staff scales according to whether you're promoted or not, and... Promoted units using basic heal staffs don't get a lot of experience out of them. Actually, it was enough to level up. Nice. That's more like it, and I think that's cap magic. No, your magic actually does cap at 30 in this game. That's good to know. I forgot that it did that. I'm pretty sure speed capped at 28, so... 30, 28. If Soren capped all of those, he'll be good to go for Radiant Dawn. Some people are saying that it's impressive that Ike's capped this many stats. Ike, in most of my runs, almost always caps Strength, Skill, Speed, and Defense. If not Defense, then I'll usually use a Draco Shield on him, because I like having Defense caps on him. And speaking of which, I think it's about time if, um, well, I mean, I suppose an Lynch can heal Jill, who I'm still annoyed that she doesn't have a support with, because that would have been amazing. That really would have been amazing. I would have loved to see that. But, uh, Ike is still asleep, but he'll be waking up soon when I'm going to actually end this with Mist. Now, there is no saving between these two parts, so if you fail the black... Ike still has the sleep status effect in this cutscene. Like, the sleep smoke above his head. Okay, let's just pretend that isn't there, because that's going to kill the movie here. I'm really sorry to do that, but... I thought he automatically got cured. And he runs off despite being asleep. So, I'm going to be cutting off this part very soon. Next time, it'll be time for the fight. For the moment of fate. Soren's trying to turn idiocy into a catchphrase now.